question myself, and this is a question that is going to channel my colleague Ron, Ron Kessler, who is here with us and, and one of the, uh, of the key members of the suicide uh, research uh, group here in Boston. And we were having a conversation uh, over lunch, and he asked a question that I think, I think is very important, and I like to pose it to the members of the panel. It is about the time of the intervention. We've been, we've been talking about We've been talking about many different types of interventions here, uh, access to means on drugs, on psychotherapy, um, or just in time interventions. But I like um, I like to pose this is about what when would be the ideal time to start any type of intervention for the fight? Is have does it uh, do we have to do it uh, right before we think? Um, uh, the attempt is going to happen or or in kindergarten. When, when is really uh, the time? So uh, we want to start with this. Yes. <laughs> I think mean, I mean, to, to channel our colleague Ron Kessler, sorry, I think you know there's lots of causes of suicide. We all could all agree on that. This is a multi-determined outcome. I don't think personally there's there's any one right time to intervene or the different opportunities to intervene so when a person is literally on the ledge i think then we, there, there's an intervention required but we shouldn't wait till then we want to go upstream from that when a person's feeling depressed and having sleep problems and is anxious and is drinking and using drugs there's interventions we can do there and of course we want to go further upstream there's been a lot of efforts to start with kindergarten and teach mindfulness as a recent trial that didn't work to teach kids mindfulness in terms of outcomes so i think we want to we want to be mindful of how to intervene, but also attend to the evidence. So I, I think there's room for all, all you know, a thousand flowers to, to bloom here. We're not good at predicting or preventing suicide. We shouldn't kid ourselves and say that we are doing this well, given uh, the data we saw in the first presentation on, on the suicide rate now being the same as more than 100 years ago when the rate increased over the past 20 years. So I think from my perspective, there's a lot of places to intervene and we should be uh, trying to intervene on, on multiple points in the pathway. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna, um... Oh, yeah. yeah, I totally agree, and I, I do think it's worth making the point, though, that that you know, in terms of the trajectory of mental health problems and suicide that we observe in the data, you know, we can't treat our way out of the problem, right? There's just not enough healthcare resources. There's not enough mental health resources currently existing in this country for the healthcare system to be the solution. And so, well, obviously, the healthcare system needs to be involved. It, I think there's just no doubt that it has to, a, a major effort has to be expanded into prevention, prevention of mental health problems, and, and investment in resources to develop ways to do that so that go beyond mindfulness interventions and yoga to like really addressing what's going on with adolescents today. Um, so, just putting that alongside what needs to happen in the healthcare system is obviously that as well. Um, I agree with those points. Uh, when it comes to sort of restricting access to firearms, what, what, when to intervene? Since we, we know that most people who kill themselves kill themselves on their first attempt. If you wait until somebody sort of attempts suicide to identify them at, at risk, you've lost a, a lot of people. Um, we did a study in Utah in which uh, we, we linked suicide deaths in, in Utah to um, a, a very large uh, statewide healthcare system to find out how many people who died by suicide had presented to uh, medical care in the hospital or emergency department over the previous three years. Among people who died by suicide, only 6% had presented for behavioral health problems. People come to the hospital for other things, but only 6% present for, uh, 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 for, for, for suicide attempts. Excuse me, 25% percent present for a, a, a behavioral health problem. And so in thinking about when the right time to intervene, to try to uh, reduce access to guns, I think the right time is any time that you can do it. And if you wait, you know, and we don't know what that right time is. I mean, maybe somebody's in a better place to make a, a decision if they're not in, in acute distress, um, but the motivation to do that may not be sort of as, as strong. And um, like, preventing people from getting a gun in the first place, that can be done starting sort of right now in a pub, public health uh, messages, as well as in clinics. Um, we don't even ask people if they have guns to start those conversations uh, 
so I guess my 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 maybe long uh, winded answer is that we should be trying to figure out sort of how to talk to people so that you can maximize the likelihood that they won't become gun owners. That's what I believe. You can maximize the likelihood that they're going to get rid of their guns, as well as paying attention to how do you do that to people who you can identify as, as an elevated risk. And, and then the question, which you didn't ask, but follows, right, is when do you give the guns back? And we also don't know anything about that. Just <clears throat> briefly to echo what's come up earlier today, it also seems that different people are going to need different interventions, yes, but also different timed interventions. Some of the work that Matt was sharing about these just-in-time adaptive interventions that are constantly very intensely monitoring people, we probably wouldn't want to try that strategy on a population level with everyone, right? It would make sense to use models to use um, available health data, electronic health record data, other data to try to identify who are the people who are at the absolute highest risk and over short periods of time, and then use these very intensive interventions for those people. Um, whereas for those who may have baseline sort of elevated risk factors with how many have experienced suicidal thoughts and behaviors, the interventions that are maybe lower intensity, um, a bit more aimed toward prevention, right, that make more sense. So I'm sure we'll talk about this more today, but a lot of us think that there's a really important potential role in developing models that predict people's risk and which interventions they're more or less likely to respond to, which will also likely have something to do with the intervention timing and when it's delivered. Yeah, I, I think in the, in the spot on, I think we definitely need to understand how to personalize you know, our interventions, but I would ask, uh, and also to, again, this, this dynamic, uh, the, the, the COVID is longitudinal data that teach us not only how to initially triage a patient based on risk, but then do so dynamically. So in other words, how you're responding to that intervention could then, that data, those interim assessments could ideally then predict, well, what are you gonna benefit from next? And we constantly update those models, you know, in, in literally the healthcare systems that have this running in the background. But um, being able to dynamically triage, I think is another way of really pinpoint you know, those most intensive, uh, you know, most effective uh, uh, potential intervention values we need to make. Yeah. I think, I mean, this is done, a lot of this is done more generally, right? So if you think about cancer, we don't say, ah, chemotherapy is a solution. Most yeah. people want chemotherapy from kindergarten. You know, there's, there's different interventions. We think about different kind of health interventions um, at different points in care. So a lot of this is things that we're doing at other places. And also, so as it builds, you know, with advances in technology, we think about social media data, we think about uh, uh, online tracking, all sorts of sites are tracking us to intervene and sell us things. And, you know, these platforms don't say, aha, we sold them sneakers, now we're done. Then they sell us the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So we've got to iterate, I think, in the same way. If we can now follow people over time, um, we should do that in a way that's going to improve their health and respond to how it is that they're responding to our interest. Which again is a, a sort of trite thing to say, but we're doing this in other areas. We need to do a better job of doing this in, in mental health. Thank you. I think that that analogy with cancer is also very, very nice and different states. Um, I like to open um, to questions from the audience. Uh, I, one of you. I guess people mention that people who attempt suicide are often such a healthcare system to account for. Is there any opportunity at the complement of that said to look at EHRs and look at patients who are not being brought in to see the healthcare system and being more proactive about encouraging some of those? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there are effort, efforts afoot to do this. So a lot of us are motivated by the fact that 50% of people who die by suicide saw a clinician in the month for their death. So they're in the healthcare system, they're being seen often, uh, as Dr. Miller was saying, not for behavioral health, but coming to the primary care doctor, coming to the ED saying, I can't sleep, my back hurts, something doesn't feel right, but they're coming in. So I think a lot of us are saying, aha, uh, you know, if we're trying to catch fish passing through, 50% of them are coming right through our, our net, so to speak. We should focus there because those are where the easiest opportunities are. But we don't want to ignore the other 50%. Uh, we think about the VA, 
uh, most veterans who are dying by suicide aren't in the aren't in the VA, right? Two thirds aren't. And so we can do what we can within the VA healthcare system, but then what about the other two thirds? And where I where I've seen a lot of traction or a lot of attempted traction recently is with social media. Uh, people are on Facebook, they're on Rally Point in terms of military and veterans. There's places that people are going for for support from others from their community. Uh, we think about religious communities, uh, recreational groups. People are out there in the community. They're not coming into the hospital. Uh, we have to get out where they are and try and find them and, and support them and try and do this. Yeah, the, the key here is outreach is, is, is really a key here. Uh, the ability to do so cost effectively is, 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 is going to be critical. Um, and you know, some of what I think you know, we, we have been exploring how could we um, do these animation with access points remotely, asynchronously, and reimburse. Mm -hmm. So if you don't do any of those, you're, you're, you're never going to pay for that healthcare system. They're not going to lose money on it. Uh, they don't want to devote teams of people, you know, tracking you down to fill out you know, a, a symptom scale or something like that. Um, but those are all possible. And, you know, I think, I think you know, that was uh, people throwing it out. So clearly something is going to have to be done to make these assessments, again, asynchronous. It, it can't just be tied to a visit you know, and, and uh, it has to be done remotely. The other piece of this that I wanted to add is that I think there's a real opportunity for community training. You know, when we look at, for example, opioid overdose, like the expansion of naloxone, right? Like this is very proximal to an overdose event. It reverses an overdose, and we've made huge investments in making naloxone available to bystanders, training people on how to use it, reduce the stigma associated with it, and. I, I feel like there's been a lot of discussion in the mental health field about like what's the naloxone for us that we can train people to do really simple things like you know not being afraid of asking the question, asking your friends and family members that they're feeling suicidal. You know, just simple ways we can train the community to respond to the mental health needs of their friends, neighbors, and family, including at what point is it appropriate to say, hey, maybe you want to hook up to someone, and making that access possible. You know, I feel like. There's an analogy with what was done in opioid overdose that's appropriate to use. Um, yes, I was going to make a similar point. There's this really, um, really wonderful program called QPR that some of you might be familiar with, Question, Persuade, Refer, which is really geared towards lay people, not mental health professionals, but about right, directly asking the questions about suicide, persuading people to potentially talk to someone. What, what I also wanted to mention is that there probably still will be a substantial number of people who have a lot of distrust of the healthcare system and will never necessarily uh, either be able to access or, or want to come in. Um, this is a, can especially be the case for suicidal thoughts and behaviors, which are really stigmatized. And people can often have concerns about, and Matt was touching on this, what's going to happen if I tell someone that I'm suicidal? Are the police going to come to my home? Am I going to be hospitalized against, um, against my will, right? Which are valid concerns and um, have very real implications for certain people in our society, right? And thinking about police violence and, and all of these things. So we also need, as, as we're all saying, right, these interventions to, yes, target people to come to the healthcare system and other strategies to meet people where, they at, where they're at, even if coming in um, for care via traditional means probably isn't something that they would, would ultimately do. Um, I'd just like to add to that, that part of sort of getting the community involved would also be getting them to recognize that they can do something by holding onto someone's gun. Safeguarding a gun for someone else, that hasn't come up, right? It's not part of QPR, we didn't mention it, but there are things you can do that are, that are not necessarily, they're not stigmatizing. Find out, you know, you should be able to reach out to somebody and say, I'm concerned about you. And uh, uh, it should be like, reaching for someone's keys if they're drunk and you don't want them to drive home. Like if that's like a great idea, it's crazy that we're not already thinking about it. It's the leading right method used. And the other thing that I'd like to sort of exploit right now is the opportunity to ask Matt about adding something about getting rid of a gun to your just in time notices. Is that something that 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 you're well, it doesn't matter if you're doing it or not. I think it would be good to, 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 to think about 
doing it because in the moment, like we don't want to wait, but if they're still there, we've got a chance to do something. Yeah. We're willing to try anything. Uh, I don't presume to know how to prevent suicide. We're trying for a long time. We're still not anywhere near. Um, the trick is if you're doing a just in time intervention and we're monitoring people, we know that suicidal thoughts ebb and flow. We're, we don't yet know when the high risk periods are. So right now, when we see people's intent and plan creeping up, we intervene, we reach out to them, we do risk assessments as clinicians, and we try and keep them safe. When's the right time to try and take them? We don't have the resources, or it's not, it's not feasible to say, give me your gun, okay, I'm fine. Give me your gun, I'm fine. So we've got to, we can find the high risk time, absolutely. But, but aren't sure. they all at high risk that you're dealing with? Yes, they're high risk insofar as they've all been in a psychiatric hospitalization recently. So they're all at high risk. Yep. So like I would say to aggressively, yep. it doesn't matter whether they're peaking or troughing. So I, yep. I can say it louder like this. <laughs> um, I didn't want to be both aggressive and voluble, but uh, I guess this is not going to stop me from being voluble. Uh, they're all at high risk. It's a good time to try to get rid of their gun. Um, and sort of if you don't succeed at first, like you've got information about they're becoming even more well, uh, even more acutely at risk that it, it seems like information that if that you can use or you can you can feed to people that you're referring these patients to so that they can they can try to act do whatever what would most substantially and immediately reduce their risk yeah sure i think you presume more control that we have that it, we do yeah we can't get people to fill out surveys and wear a wristwatch let alone yeah uh, go to treatment take their medication let alone take their gun from them Fair enough, and I'm, as that I'm trying to exploit the moment, it, I, I, and 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 it, it's an unenviable task, but it, it's sort of a notice noticeable lacuna in sort of what's come up in terms of what we're doing. Let's refer them to treatment, and there's stigma associated with uh, medical health care. They're afraid police will show up. All true. So reasons to to also exploit sort of other opportunities to have neighbors, friends, families. Uh, also uh, uh, act on reducing exposure to guns. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just wondering how your thoughts were on the role of um, moral beliefs in suicide and suicide prevention, both at the individual level and with respect to public health community. So on the individual level, is the belief that suicide is wrong in relation to likelihood of suicide, and if so, might you know, public health promotion efforts along the lines of emphasizing the dignity of work, the value of the, the human person, the, the, the helpful, you know, perhaps even pushing towards the notion that no one has the right to take the life of a human person, including one's own. And then second, with respect to the public health community, should the public health community be taking a position like that? And you know, if, if not, then what exactly is the justification for suicide prevention efforts. And I think as Carrie pointed out in her first presentation, unlike all other mental health conditions, suicide is intended, that is intended, it's desired. So if we're not taking a position that this is wrong, how is this not a violation of autonomy or what else that provides this or how should the public health community be thinking about this? Very impulsive, I keep jumping to the microphone first. And I don't think yeah. that, these are, these are really, really great questions. Um, so I'll jump in, I'll try and be brief. Well, you all saw how that went with my presentation, so maybe I won't be so brief. Um, yeah, so I mentioned briefly the, the classical conditioning or evaluative conditioning interventions that we did. Um, we see when we use sort of implicit tests, we see that people who are suicidal have a um, less negative feeling or less negative evaluation about death, about death. Which tracks, I think, with really, you know, religions, uh, moral beliefs about death being a bad thing, uh, a sin, and so on. You see, in people who are religions where suicide is more frowned upon, you see lower suicide rates. So we see that at the individual level. And the intervention that I described is intended to make people think of suicide as a more aversive thing. And when we can build up that aversion, we see lower risk of suicide attempts. So it does seem to be a sort of in. Um, to help people to have more negative feelings about suicide to get them to be less likely to kill themselves. We've gotten some pushback on this from some people who say, well, you're stigmatizing suicide. You're making it seem like a bad thing. I would say it kind of isn't bad. Like as a father of three, I think it's a bad thing for my kids to think suicide's a good thing. So I'm happy to have them think negatively about suicide. But I, the point is taken about, about um, the community. In terms of, is it 
okay for us to prevent people from doing something that they want to do? I think so. And there are, I've talked about this briefly at lunch. There are instances we can talk about where maybe many of us think it's okay to let a person take their life. If we have, for instance, no treatment to provide, we tried everything and it stopped. We can't drive that, that risk down. I'm often inspired by, come back to the fact that um, I think it was, I think you mentioned 90% of people who make a suicide attempt don't want to make the attempt. Um, go on to die. Ron Kessler's um, Army Star study showed that in terms of persistence of suicidal thinking, more than around half of people who have suicidal thoughts, after the first year they have those thoughts, those thoughts never come back again. And so the idea is if we can get people through this high risk and keep them alive, if they're going to want to stay alive the rest of their life after that, shouldn't be trying to do that. But we can think of instances where those thoughts are really persistent and there's no improvement and we have no treatment to offer, then maybe we do take a step back and say, well, we tried everything. We're not going to lock a person in the hospital for the rest of their life, rest of their life so they can't kill themselves. Um, but I think for most instances, that's not the case, that there's um, value, I think, in trying to get a person through that high risk period. And take their guns away during that period. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> The other thing I would just add to that is, you know, I, I totally agree, and I and I think the kind of like moral case for public health interventions for suicide is that most people don't want to die when they get through that period. So they regret, um, you know, hopefully recovering from their suicide attempt. But I think the other piece of it in terms of public health that we don't want to do in terms of like making people feel bad about being suicidal is that we know that shame is, is not effective for, you know, reducing any kind of health outcome. We want to reduce something. So I well, I agree with you that like we need to convince people that like we don't want to we don't want to die by suicide. We don't want to make them feel ashamed for their like mental health problems. So it's it is that tough balance, I think, of making sure that people know that it's that we want them to live and that you know, you know, it's not good to to want to kill yourself, but also like to to feel okay about sharing that for all the reasons we talk about. Can I can I rebut? Sure. I agree. Uh, and the intervention isn't, how dare you think about suicide? What's wrong with you? It's, it's pairing suicide images with snakes and spiders, things that we have natural aversion to, so that we implicitly, classically condition a person to have an aversion to the idea of suicide. So try and get back the aversion. Of, most of us have an aversion to it, and for people who are suicidal, it seems to erode a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. trying to get it back. Just one brief. And another. <laughs> One brief example of this dimension you may notice that um, in our talks today, we, we we weren't using the term commit suicide. This is um, a term that was has, has been used a lot and, and is still used, but increasingly there's um, consensus that that language in and of itself is very stigmatizing. It's sort of likening suicide to committing a crime, right? And so now recent consensus is that we should um, use terms like died by suicide, suicide deaths, rather than to commit suicide. So I think, as we're all saying, it's just it's tricky in terms of yes, wanting to um, to emphasize that right, this is this is not an ideal outcome, right? There's other ways, and and at the same time, not making people feel shame for experiencing suicidal thoughts and behaviors, or making those who have a loved one die by suicide feel guilty about not having done what they could do um, to potentially prevent it. This is another issue in terms of, um, there's a, been a whole recent literature around um, the potential flip side of sort of framing suicide as preventable and how that um, can make providers or loved ones feel a lot of shame and a lot of guilt after they do have a loved one who, who died by suicide. So it's an interesting, mm -hmm. interesting tension. Anyone else? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, all the questions. Please. And it just seems that there's a real disconnect between that kind of language and the language that we use to say we would encourage people to see that, we would encourage people. To you know, take their medication, we would encourage them to do things. And so, like, that, I mean, I can understand this with cancer. I can understand that people get nervous about that and all of the like, but like the language is just seems to be wrong. It does seem to be there. There's a very fairly easy way of handling that to talk to people who are just to try and kill themselves about their illness because if you don't prevent the attempt, and that happens most of the time. 
Thank you for the comment. Any reactions or comments? That's why I wasn't there. <laughs> incredibly articulate hand. Um, uh, and I usually just don't say anymore. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, so Weston. Yeah, uh, I was just going to comment on this. We work in the VA, it's complicated. Um, uh, I, I don't disagree with you in theory and in practice. If you repeatedly ask our folks, about this, or if you make pleas with them to uh, get guns out of the house, you won't see them again. They won't come back. That's the problem. That's that's what makes this tricky because we don't want to alienate them. We don't want them to not come back. The truth is, we want them to come back. Um, we want to take care of them. That's what makes this so complicated. Can I respond to that? That that's that's a question. I, I'm really interested in the. In the empirical evidence that they that they don't come back, we were working with people at the San Francisco VA, um, Deb and I, and um, we were really interested in whether because at the San Francisco VA, uh, they were asking everybody uh, uh, whether they had gone, and we were really interested in in that question, like did they come back? And um, there was a fear, right, that they wouldn't. But um, like, what what are you, with all due respect, what are you basing sort of the, those statistics? On. Not necessarily hard data as much as just, you know, patients talking with their therapists. And it, it is just, it, it is a concern. Um, these are um, patients who feel very strongly about their gun rights. And um, if you, um, uh, for lack of a better word, pester or sit and ask them about it, um, they won't, you know, either they won't engage you in the discussion or they will just choose not to, um, not to do that. So, yeah, I mean, it is something that I agree with you that does need to be studied. It's a hard thing to study, obviously, but um, it is, it, um, again, I, in, in reality, in, in our particular environment, it's just a very, very tricky thing with people who feel very, very strongly about their guns, their property, their privacy. Um, and you're not telling me what to do. Right, no, it's, please go ahead. Well, I will just say, as someone that is one of the trauma clinics, we do routinely like, ask anyone if they serve a firearm. We do have discussions about safety and creating a space. Um, and I would say that's a different question than having a discussion about removal or um, getting out of a gun's hold. And so, with patients that I've worked with who are flagged at Titus for suicide because it's a system, I can have those conversations, and if I continue with my list each visit, there, the likelihood of them coming back has been really, really small. Um, and so that makes it a clinical decision of do I want to leave you so that you still do something, or do I want to keep having this conversation that it might be a Well, that, that's really that's really helpful to hear. Um, and, and I don't mean to diminish the challenge in having conversations and in figuring out the right tempo and the right way to do it. Um, uh, the, the preliminary data that we had at the VA, sort of grossly not at, at the individual level, is that it didn't seem to make much difference. But, but maybe it had an impact on the kind of relationship. My, my, the reason that I'm pushing back a little and, and asking you about more detail is I am concerned that we prejudge sort of, uh, and stigmatize the conversation because we don't necessarily know how to do it well now. And that could be a real impediment sort of to figuring out sort of what is the right way. I mean, my, I, I'm a clinician myself, um, but uh, the, the, this particular type of conversation uh, I, I haven't had uh, uh, frequently because it's been a long time. But when we did clinical trials in Colorado, when you had parents 
speaking, uh, whose kids came in with a mental health crisis or suicide attempt, we, we and, and we trained the behavioral health clinicians to talk to the parents about removing the gun from the home or storing it in a way that kids couldn't get the gun. There were no problems. There was a way, and that's something, that's an ED clinician doesn't have an established relationship with that patient. And so my challenge to you is not to say that it's easy, but to try to figure out how you can leverage the relationship that you obviously have because you care about your patients. And if what the message that they're getting is, I'm talking with you, not as a gun expert, but as someone who cares and recognizes you're at heightened risk, that that, like figuring out how that can permeate and be the main message that they hear um, is, I, I think, something sort of worth, worth studying and worth um, persisting on. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't disagree with, with any of that. I think it's an important thing to be thinking about and figuring out a way to approach folks and talk about it uh, and figuring out who is more amenable to these kinds of conversations and when to approach them and things like that. I think that this is all very important. Just very briefly to mention, and those of you talking about this now are very well aware, but in sort of gold standard safety planning, and there now have been these single session interventions developed for, for means restriction or means reduction. And a lot of them use a technique called motivational interviewing, which is really about not the provider being the expert and sort of telling the patient what to do, but rather really trying to meet the person where they're at and explore, um, for example, the pros and cons of, of, of gun ownership. Um, and there is, so there is some, some guidance out there, which um, a lot of us as clinicians are doing around how to have these conversations in a way that isn't about us just telling you what to do. Um, that said, my understanding is that the effects are still fairly small overall in the, in the trials that have been done. So it's certainly, it's certainly tricky. And as Dr. Marks is saying, there are probably some patients who are much more amenable to even engaging in that type of conversation than, than others. Thank you. This is an extremely interesting conversation that ties together many of the themes of today. We're talking really about uh, access to means for society. We're talking about health system. We're talking about clinical care, about just in in prevention. So um, this is uh, this is so great. But uh, we'll have a lot of time left, and I would like to I would like to ask a question to our panelists about something. Uh, that, that is very important for many of us here, looking at the future, is, um, okay, um, how, how, can we, how can we do better in terms of research in the future, as several of the speakers have mentioned, uh, there is a new training grant based here at the School of Public Health in collaboration with uh, people at the Department of Psychology and the hospitals here and the medical school. So we are going to be training um, uh, the next generation of, of investigators on suicide prevention. And that's a big responsibility. So how, how can we do it? What is important here? What should we emphasize? Um, what type of studies we should do? What, what, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I would just like to make a plug that you know, a, a, a lot of what's been discussed today in terms of that individual level prediction and identifying people who are at high risk um, and using EHR data in a really adaptive way um, to just remember that suicide risk goes beyond these individual level factors and understanding, you know, we were about, no, we published a paper where we use the same types of machine learning prediction models that have been used for individual level suicide using EHR data and instead use county level unemployment, temperature, altitude, gun ownership, and these spatial and environmental factors, and they do as well as the individual level prediction models. So integrating those together, understanding what a person's history is, but also where they're physically located, um, I think that's what I'd like to see in terms of additional studies that are using the types of data that you all are using. It's like, integrating those physical and social environmental factors into those prediction models, I think it would be very valuable. I agree. And I would take one step further and say for people interested in that kind of research, and for people interested in suicide prevention in this local community, 
you should consider going to callthelab.com <laughs> and look at the T32 training grant that we recently received to train people in doing comparative effectiveness research on suicide prevention. There's a lot of data that we already have available, we broadly, that aren't really being used to understand what are the most effective interventions uh, for subgroups of people at risk and the work that the Gale and people are doing is, is really strongly needed in this area. So seriously, we'd love to see people get, in, get involved in this, in this, uh, in this effort. Good. Yeah, I, uh, my two thoughts are, you know, for reverse translation, you know, folks who are steeped in your uh, advanced uh, call and interest methods, you know, we, we need a workforce. And, uh, and then for forward translation, folks who are steeped in kind of, um, you know, adaptive trial designs that, that, that Ben Hoff was talking about, I think those are just critical. Because when you're dealing now with, you know, uh, learning health systems, and, you know, there's only been, you know, a number of proof of concept, you know, sort of, uh, it, it, I, I shouldn't have said this is, has not been done and we're going to do it because it, there already is evidence that this learning health system approach uh, is going to, you know, hopefully make these problems tractable. And, you know, Ron did the FDA study and Greg, you know, did his, um, Mental health research on you know, study, which were effectively, uh, you know, learning health systems, right? And, um, but we're so we're going to have lots and lots and lots of data, data sets, longitudinal, you know, etc. Um, what we really need are the folks who can literally do those adaptive trials, really just figure out how do you, you know, iteratively figure out what you're interested in and how you adjust the data on you know, the data driven manner. And then on the back end, you know, literally have a way to you know, mine the data uh, and treat every clinical encounter as a single one experiment. But we're just going to need um, you know, all the interest methods that, that play out at the same time. I want to come back to something and disagree with something that Matt said. Not that no, but Matt not myself. <laughs> um, I, I don't think you should do the things that we're doing. <laughs> Uh, because we haven't made enough, enough I think you should do the the the, the, the either two to be sure. Um, but we haven't made a lot of progress as suicide researchers, if we're if we're being honest. So I think new approaches are needed. Uh, there's a a famous Harvard sociobiologist named E.O. Wilson, uh, who has written a great book called Letters to a Young Scientist about how to be a good scientist. Um, if like me, you don't like reading, you'd rather watch a movie. Get the 15 minute TED talk. Uh, one of the things he says is uh, to be a good. There's an old dictum that says to be a good soldier. Uh, march toward the sound of the guns. So if you're in the, you know, on the battlefield, go towards where the action is. To be a good scientist, do the exact opposite. Go away from the sound of the gun. So don't just do the things that are people are, have been trying. Try other stuff. Um, try community-based interventions. Try combining data. You know, do things that, that um, we and others haven't been doing. I think that's what's needed is, is new ideas, new ways and new approaches. Kate has them. Um, speaking specifically to psychosocial intervention research, you can see from most of the studies I presented today, the sample sizes are pretty small, right? These are like 100 patients is considered a decently big trial in this area, right? Which is really problematic in terms of our ability to actually, actually observe low base rate outcomes like suicide attempts and deaths, get reliable estimates. And also, as we've all been talking about, right, precision medicine and predicting who is most likely to respond to what intervention, we really can't do that with these with these small trials. So, an example of right, the eighteen thousand patient study that I presented is a really um, a really nice option of thinking about right recruiting people through records. And I was talking about social media, et cetera. Um, I also have a, a question too that I'm curious for your thoughts on Phil. It relates to this is um, you said a, a pretty surprising statistic that I've heard before that you said that nine the ten percent of mental health providers use me measures in there. It's, it's if you look across clinicians because you know the, the focus of uh, locus of care is treatment in the primary care. Uh, so uh, if you look across you know clinicians that are treating you know, people with, with mental illness, um, it, it, it's it's getting better. But the, the number I saw, and I think this is from you know, Matt and Monica, uh, it, it, it may be outdated, but you know, it is as low as 15% measure in this you know, standardized fashion, uh, some validated patient report outcome. And what they're doing in the absence of that is 
you know, I, you know, I, I know when I was you know practicing, I don't think I asked the same questions in a standardized fashion across patients, just uh, within patients, you know, over time. And so, you know, what exactly that does, um, I don't know, but it would be awfully hard to uh, do medicine based care and um, make a uh, initial treatment selection or um, you know, monitor and adjust the treatment. Uh, so, um, anyway, it, it's, it's, it's low hanging fruit to, to start there. And then, you know, the resulting you know, relational database that, that every healthcare system would have in the new uh, EHR would then have this longitudinal, at least symptom um, assessments, um, which are a good start. And the answer to doing that is just requiring that providers do it, like um, in order to get. So, um, that's great. I didn't cover this, but uh, in that little box of my measurement based care slide, there was, you know, longitudinal assessments uh, of ground flu. Uh, the only way you're going to really get this substantially is if uh, have insurance required. And so, I had the good fortune of um, being uh, the PI of uh, a CMS. Um, uh, uh, Jen Jenner is validating the next uh, generation of quality measures for the QPD program. Uh, so the QPD program is what CMS uses as potentially a tool of validating quality measures that all insurers need to use. In other words, you can't develop your own. And reimbursement is tied to this. Like, for example, Medicare uh, with the MIPS program. Uh, if you don't report any quality measures versus you do them very effectively and you're doing a great job, there's a 20% swing uh, in reimbursement. So that's a big incentive for clinicians. So the number one measure they wanted to develop and validate, which was a uh, the registry, was a um, quality measure to demonstrate that the new measure was safe. Uh, the number two one that they wanted was to show that you uh, are screening and doing um, uh, screen for suicide and doing not different things. Thanks. Those all sound really great. And, and, and your grant, like oh, getting young scientists to become interested in doing something about suicide prevention is fantastic. I did, Sonia Swanson, uh, who uh, both Miguel and I are crazy about, uh, she has elevated the science in the suicide prevention area. There are people out there that can do the same. We really, we really need it. Uh, there are so many it, methodological needs that we have. Uh, the confounder, the bias that I talked about, that was a binary confounder. You know, maybe one of you will develop methods that extend it beyond that. Uh, maybe, maybe Tyler, you, I'm sure you have already, but <laughs> they'll help you with the, whatever the next dimension is. And uh, and this, the study of firearm legislation is very, very sloppy. And um, I mean, I'm not even talking, you can, the, there are tons of papers published that are cross-sectional to evaluate the effect of a law. And essentially what they find, but they call it uh, the effect of a law is that where there are more guns, there are more suicides due to gun suicide. Like, but there are, there, but even studies that have sort of pre-post measures are sort of fraught with sort of type one error. And we need to develop much better methods for evaluating that sort of uh, in, in, in intervention. Um, there are just something that the people use composite controls to try to model uh, what happens after a, 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 an event. And I don't know like what's wrong with those, but the, the outcomes that they get make no sense. Like we're, 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 we're bullet, uh, if you can figure out what kind of fingerprint a bullet lives, your, leaves, that those laws are gonna reduce suicide by 30%, or that a child access prevention law is gonna reduce suicide by 25%. And same among adults as among children. I mean, we need people to go into the field and take a serious look sort of at firearm legislation. Uh, it's because it, it, like it, it's going to, it can help at the margin, but the effect size, how much it's changing the exposure sort of plausibly is not related to what's being published. And so we really need people to, um, to develop methods and to review papers sort of more seriously. And then there's sort of the, the slew of 
needs that we have related to doing basic research that depends on talking to gun owners about what it is that, that led them to divest of their guns. We know nothing. We know from one study by Joey Works uh, in, in, in a survey that we conducted. There was no clue that they were at such a high risk from that, from that survey. We, we need to understand like what it is so that we can try to develop interventions to get other people to act on that. And that requires sort of funding qualitative work and serious uh, uh, quantitative work that doesn't delegate to someone who's sort of attached to the, uh, has a pecuniary interest in selling guns like, like gun store owners or NSSF, but rather talks to the people who own guns to figure out what you can do what works, what would work with them. And the other thing I'll add to that is that like, I totally agree and it's all about funding, right? I mean, like look at this T32 that you guys now have and you're gonna be able to train all these people in suicide research and in mental health research. So alongside like, you know, it's almost like you have to identify people at high risk for being a mental health researcher and then do an adaptive intervention <laughs> to funnel them to a funding program and a mentor who's going to, you know, all of us, when we got into science, like a lot of it was chance but in terms of like what we actually ended up studying. And a lot of it was like, I, this someone had funding in my department and, and they were able to pay me 10 hours a week to research whatever, you know, and that's how we get started in our careers. And so like the pipeline to getting those people is having the funding available to do it. Thank you. I, um, I, I'm taking notes here. Uh, very, very good comments here about what to do, looking beyond the individual uh, learn root cause and influence method, develop new methods. Um, it, also, you, you were talking about adaptive trials, and essentially, um, I hear that as we have to generate new data. So I'd like to ask, to ask a question to our panelists, which is that which data do we need for the future? And um, why don't we have, and what has to change so that we can access this data that you think we need? I mean, I'll just start with one thing on the sort of FE surveillance side is that, and I think I mentioned this in my talk as well, is that for in suicide research, especially, there's such a long gap between when an event occurs and when we get data about it. And that is that has really, I think, prevented a lot of like really critical research. Is that you know part of it is necessity. You have to do investigations, and you have to that takes some time. But there's just unacceptably long gaps between when researchers get data and when events occur. And to me, that's like a huge part of what needs to change. Anyone else? Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, okay. We should push to have a firearm registry everywhere, not just in California. California's a big state. It's good that California has a registry, but there's no reason, right? There doesn't violate the even this court's interpretation of the Second Amendment. We should have a registry everywhere so that we know who has guns, what kind. When they divest, when they become gunners, what, when they become unlawful possessors, so that you can take them away. So uh, th that that would make a big difference. You could do what we're doing in California at much larger scale. You know, we should we should be able to link those data with minimal impediment to all sorts of outcomes that we know influence suicide and outcomes that in which guns play a big role, not just suicide, but sort of homicide and and other, other, other forms of, of violence. But with suicide, it would be great to, to know how many kids live in these homes. So linked to school systems, linked to medical records so that you can know, okay, these people who divested, well, look at their psychiatric and, 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 and behavioral health history. Um, and, and to do that on a, on, on a, on a grander scale, uh, very simply like the BRFSS, the behavioral risk factor uh, survey, it, the first time it asked a question about do you have a gun in your home? Right? Was 2001. They then asked the question again in 2002 and asked a, a storage question in 2004. Since then, zero, not one year, has the Bureau of has asked the question about do you have a gun in your home? So the data we have about state level gun ownership is based on data from 2004. Um, that, 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 that makes no sense. We also don't have any information about how people store their guns over time. 
So when you're evaluating laws that try to influence storage practices, cap laws, your laws, like all those laws were enacted in the 1990s and early 2000s, and there are no data about storage. So you're left with really indirect methods of trying to assess what might have happened. Um, and then it's like, uh, maybe we could work with Google or uh, uh, other places like that where, where they must know, I bet they know whether I have a gun or you have a gun, sort of the pro proxies have been developed and, um, but, but we should work with them to, to try to figure out, is there some information about exposure that they can help us evaluate? Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, get off the soapbox. Uh, and I'll just follow up on, on the, the uh, thoughts around uh, linking expert data sets to, you know, clearly what's going into a you know, DHR data, you know, committing the big conglomerate and stuff, you know, targeting and they're coming out of your eyeballs, right? In fact, it's, it's such a problem that you need to know how to sample it. In other words, you, know, you have almost too much data, right? And, and so even for a rare outcome like uh, suicide, you know, you, I, in, in some ways, you know, how do you take a sample to compare, you know, people who have a suicide and outcome, right? To, it's, um, and, you know, other methods that, that will have to get worked out, you know, are, uh, you know, resulting from this overabundance of data. You know, how do you not overfit your models? You know, how do you, do you know what I mean? I mean so, so uh, in some sense, it's, it's not the paucity of data. It, it may be having too much, but what we do need are other expert data sets. So I completely agree. We need to know about you know, your structural, the socio structural, every, you know, in other words, we need to know what's going on in the environment. Uh, so I, I, I didn't cover what I meant by uh, growing a learning health community around a learning health system. Learning health system is a start, but through data use agreements, you know merging with extant data, you can start, uh, and you need community partnerships. Don't, don't try to do this as, you know, as health care, because health care is not fully trusted. Right? But if you have community partners and you can get community data, like I said, schools, criminal justice, you know, primary care, we're lucky we're becoming low case of health care. So now it's the criminal justice system. And if we don't merge in criminal justice data, we don't know an awful lot. We've got this huge blind spot, this huge neglect, right? And and the um, but if, if if you do merge in these community data sets, what it, it suddenly allows you to do is prevent, prevent before you get to the point of needing healthcare. Right, right now we're stuck. If you're in a learning health system, we wait for you to get sick, and then then, then, then we, we treat you. Um, what we really want to do is get there early, early in the in early development because you know from the national comorbidity survey you know we know that uh, neonatal onset when I wanted to 14 right but we want to prevent health disorders that means we have to be somewhere in school maybe even literal I mean literally you know, intervening on agency I mean by the time you you end up you know taped off after I don't see patients anymore but well actually I did during my initial time in therapy group. Um, it's game over, it's too late. You know, you've already lost function, you're, you're impaired. And at that point, we don't, we honestly, you know, our treatments get a little bit stronger. Yeah, that's fine. So um, the real key is, 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 is the excellent data sets that allow you to be able to grow a learning health community where you can actually make prevent. And I would add to that, uh, stitching together data in this way and using a tiered approach where we say, look, look across the learning health system and find people at risk, combining this with intensive longitudinal monitoring. I mean, we, we now have models, thanks to the work of Bill and Ron and others, where we can say, well, here's people passing through a hospitalization. One out of three of these people is going to try and kill themselves in the next four weeks. Well, you know, good luck to them. We now have ways of monitoring and carefully over time and building models to intervene. So I think we have to start combining a lot of these different methods in ways that give us not just more data, but better temporal granularity rather than trying new interventions to test people um, Synth when they're at risk. Synthetic cohorts. You can develop a cadre. If you can develop a, so when we do get these extant data sets merged with, you know, healthcare system data, 
uh, community or the school they are in, or these sorts of things, prenatal caregivers, whatever. Um, when we are coaches, we know how to work with them. So like uh, when I was at NIH, you know, we, we had sadly had to um, stop the uh, uh, National Children's Study, which would have been such a boom for, for, for mental illness because we would have followed a, a true birth order and we would have learned about very, very early modifiers determinants of, of, of mental illness, suicide, these sorts of things. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't happen in the same way. Why it never uh, launched and why it was defunded. But um, that having been said, I think the problem is still tracking. Uh, if, if we have folks that know how to work with these, these, um, these extant data sets with health care leaders and uh, create synthetic uh, birth orders, in other words, maybe we can learn what happens, you know, so maybe the mom that uh, experienced trauma and, you know, uh, had PTSD and uh, wasn't uh, uh, treated with C CBT and led to a, an anxious temperament kid and went to an anxious anxiety and a substance abuse uh, you know, disorder, some, some terrible trajectory. We, we, we can learn in this way. And we can also learn in terms of them. So uh, as a third area, I would love folks if they have the methodologic kind of training would, would be in this kind of um, uh, developing synthetic birth cohorts with these, these very large pool of extant uh, data sets. Great. Thank you. Um, time flies when you are learning. Um, we have time maybe for a last brief question with a brief response, Chris. <laughs> I'm just curious about other data sources. Should we or are we thinking about neuroimaging and genomics as helpful in this area of those two all the time? Yeah. Um, so I'll Again, you know, among the different extant data sets that we emerged, I know it's happened, but it's so I mean, we hope we have told you we told you. Um, uh, you know, I so many times to like I feel like Rick, Rick Van Winkle, I was at MIT two decades ago, I woke up and everybody is like a smarter than me. Like <laughs> any of you are in training, out of training, you, you are like Infinitely smarter than me. Like, what happened to me? <laughs> but um, the <laughs> um, there's uh, so part of what I woke up to, and part of why I'm actually now back at NBC, is the, the RPDR. You know, there's this, this so we funded this thing called uh, when I was at the NIH side, uh, actually, NIH side, it's common sense. We funded ITBC. I don't know if any of you worked with this data, right? But it, it's this very, very high dimensional data uh, on, you know, put into a common data format uh, that has genomics. Some people you'll have, you know, transcript, you name the omics, you name the imaging, you, some of even probably biosensor data, I guess, in, in, in different studies, right? And on everything, on all, how many million patients did it? Was like six, six million. I think it's six million patients. You have all of their EHR data and everything else. You know, you have biospecimens on hundred, two hundred thousand. They sequence, and, and so you you have this. It, it's like literally like oh, we were dreaming of this twenty years ago. I wake up, it's actually here, and again. You know, Two billion notes have been natural language processed, but you know the future is here, literally here. Uh, and you know, you name the large academic health center; they've probably done the same. So um, the question is how to work with the data. You know, I mean, this is no no easy, this is no easy task, right? I mean, but and what do we have to supplement the data with? Because right? again, in mental health. Um, there is a paucity of measurement. Those who are missing those very key uh, and temporally relevant factors that would make things like kicking and moving in real time suicide, um, we need those. Data. Thank you. Thank you.
but everything else is there. Yeah. I would add a note of the current pessimism that <laughs> uh, recent studies that have tried to do this have, haven't been successful. So we can make predictions about suicidal behavior from self-report, from EHR risk scores, when we add in uh, genetic risk scores from blood samples, it doesn't exist. Um, recent meta-analysis of biomarkers for suicide, virtually nothing came in across since they had 50 years of, of research. So the fact that we haven't been successful tells us to be careful and cautious, but you know, everything hasn't been tried yet. So maybe as we now scale up, maybe as, as newer, uh, better minds uh, try and tackle this, we'll still be better solutions. But so far, to answer the question, we haven't, haven't been able to do it yet, but that doesn't, doesn't mean it can't be done for sure. And the other thing that I would add to it, just from a, you know, from the, the public health side of things, is that you know, over the last few years, we've invested a lot in building these data systems that have a lot of biological data. And we haven't placed the same emphasis on building measures of social determinants of health in the social environment. So again, not to be like, I don't know, I feel like we each have our like thing that we hang our hat and minds like the social environment, but but not to say that investing in those technologies and, and in building those data systems isn't potentially valuable, but it has to be placed in terms of resource allocation alongside the need for really rich characterizations of these social determinants. I mean, even if you look at like, you know, the, the meta-analyses that have been done on gene by environment interactions for mental health outcomes, the measures of the environment are atrocious. I mean, why do you think we're gonna detect a signal of anything when you're asking people single questions about how stressed they are is, you know, so I, I think alongside that, we just need to be investing more in, in measurement of the social environment. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we, we have uh, we have reached the end of, of our session. And uh, for those of, of you who are in the room, please feel free to continue the conversation with our, with our panelists at the reception outside of this hall. And I, I'd like to finish with a few words of of thanks, uh, thanks to our speakers and panelists that have made this possible uh, from which from whom we have learned so much. Uh, thank you to the Colocatronics Symposium Fund, uh, which which uh, supports this event. And and I want also uh, to thank the Cosa Lab team that have made this possible, specifically Kathleen Tagmeyer, Joanna Mikalski, and Gonzalo Martinez. Alas, uh, with without them, this would have been. <laughs>